Welcome back to People Who Matter. Dr. Jay Prakash Naran, your organization Lok Sata is extremely well known and yet the surprising thing is it's only eight years old. How did you come to set it up? I think what it means is, Karan, that people of the country are ready. They really want something new. They want a change in the nature of politics. All it's required is that um, a few men and women of um, some track record get together, work together, they come up with an agenda that is not against somebody, but it is for India. It's a win-win for all. And they have some insights into governance processes. And that's exactly what we done in Andhra Pradesh. And therefore, it became a fairly sizable moment uh, with reach across the whole state, um, spreading over almost every village. Now, one of the battles that you've made your own is the battle for electoral reform. You say elections have lost their meaning as far as the people are concerned. Most people have realized with experience that the outcome of elections is of little consequence to their lives in the long run. That's a severe indictment. Do you really mean it? Yes, I do. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. On my way here, I was talking to your colleague, Arvind. I was asking him how Bihar um, uh, things are shaping up there. He says it doesn't matter who wins. That's the first response. I was in Mumbai three days ago. Mumbai city is as far from Bihar as it is possible within the country. And I was talking to a lot of uh, major public figures about cities' governance there in the context of July 26th um, uh, mishap there, that cyclone, that um, rainfall and the flood. And there is a sense of despair that it doesn't matter who is elected. It makes no difference. In Andhra Pradesh, we had elections just um, earlier this month, uh, uh, last month in October, uh, in September, for the municipalities. Minus Hyderabad city and surrounding municipalities, and minus the second biggest corporation, Vizag and surrounding municipalities. For a 70 lakh electorate, for 40, 45 lakh votes polled, the estimated expenditure is 500 crores to 700 crores. It doesn't matter who wins in these elections. That's the danger. When the people don't care what the outcome is, they're losing faith in the process. That's exactly the problem in the country right now. Now, there is one area where you've actually had a fairly significant measure of success. You've managed to force candidates to reveal their antecedents and their financial background. But has it changed the quality of MLAs and MPs that get elected? No, not much. Uh, first of all, current criminalization is merely a symptom of the underlying disease. It's like, you know, the pain or the swelling when there's cancer afflicting the body inside. Aspirin will not cure the cancer. It may reduce the side. Aspirin will not cure the cancer. It may reduce the pain for the time being in some simple swelling. It doesn't cure the cancer. And yet we have to focus on that because that's what people understand. And from there, you can go to the other more um, complicated issues related to our polity and our democracy. Uh, the only positive impact, perhaps, of this, um, this whole disclosure is the parties are now a little more careful about nominating candidates. Uh, that means fresh criminals are not nominated as candidates. The old ones continue, the established however. ones continue, because they already struck deep political roots. In fact, one of the reforms that you're pushing for is to get political parties to accept that candidates with certain heinous charges against them, where a court has taken cognizance of the offense, should be debarred. Do you think parties will actually bite that bullet? Some parties are willing. Um, for instance, the earlier NDA government actually brought in an ordinance during that whole disclosure battle which talked about eight, eight heinous offenses. They said if twice a person is charged with these offenses, then they should be disqualified. But there's no consensus. The problem is why twice? Why is once not enough? <laughs> That's true. The bar is a very difficult one to determine. But we should be very cautious about disqualification. In principle, I'm not in favor of disqualification of candidates because the political process must be such that such candidates will not be serious contenders anyway. But disqualification, if that becomes the uh, method of uh, reform in politics, we could go the Pakistan way. Absolutely. Now, for such candidates not to be serious, people have to be aware and conscious of the nature of the candidate they're voting for. What do you do when it's said that actually alleged criminals deliver goods in constituencies when they get elected? Innocent good people somehow can't make the system work. How do you change that mindset? Actually, it's not merely a mindset issue. It's also reality. That's a sad reality. It's then, a sad it? reality. What's happening is um, there are three fundamental questions we have to ask. The first is, why are the criminals intending to go into politics in the first place? Because crime investigation is politically driven, it makes good sense for, for criminals to become politicians. Because then they are insulated from crime investigation, the police um, They protect action. themselves. Yes, exactly. The second is, why are people voting for them? The people are voting for them because people like Manmohan Singh, the decent, deserving people whom we respect and honor, who have impeccable track record, 
people perceive that such honorable people can no longer deliver in a very wooden and inflexible system. And therefore... You need a crook to work a crooked exactly, system. Exactly. That is the problem. And the third is why are politicians inviting the criminals? The politicians have no choice but to invite them because they are the ones who have the caste power, money power, and therefore they are the most electable ones in a very skewed electoral system. So it's an unholy but inevitable nexus. Exactly. So it's very, very hard to break. It's the logic of the system. Now, another challenge that you've taken on, and you've taken on loads and loads of challenges, is the challenge of inner party democracy. Very candidly, you admit, and I quote, most parties are dominated by only one leader. And monarchy is the correct description of party leadership. Once in office, the power of leadership is absolute and control of resources is awesome. How deeply does this vitiate Indian democracy? Very deeply. About 25, 30 years ago, this criticism was largely applicable to the Congress party. But the iron law of Indian politics says that every party is a clone of the Congress, barring one or two exceptions in general. And therefore, you see at regional level and national level, almost all parties behaving in the same manner. And the party membership, if somebody challenges a party leader, immediately the person becomes persona non grata and out of the party. And once you're thrown out of a party, it's political death sentence. The theory of the party is political death sentence. And of course, leadership choice, the funding, and most important of all, the choice of candidates, because that is what a party is about in India, the symbol that is actually, uh, that's reduced our elections to a symbolic level in this country, because without a symbol, there's no election. People never read the name. It's only the symbol that we vote for in large measure. And therefore, the, the candidate choice of the party is what determines the ultimate outcome. All of which makes the party leader even more All absolute power. and dictatorial. Absolutely. So do you see this changing? It will change, but not in isolation. Because now the political culture has become so strongly rooted around individuals and party leadership that the incentives are not there in the party to change. Curiously, when the party members very often feel that they behold into the leader in order to survive. So it's not quite that the leader is dictatorial. It's also the party needs a dictator as a leader to broker some kind of a peace in a very fractious polity. So once again, you have to sever it if it's going to happen. Exactly. A third reform that you've taken on is that you are also campaigning for the replacement of India's first-past-the-post system of voting with some form of threshold proportional representation. And you say that this would ensure that parties are national in their outlook rather than regional and local in their focus. How exactly would that work? What's happening is take the six largest states of India, UP, Bihar, not necessarily in that order, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and West Bengal. The Congress or BJP, the two largest political parties with some kind of a national uh, spread, they're relevant to only one of the states, one of the six states, namely Andhra Pradesh, and only one of the parties, namely Congress. In none of the five other states is Congress or BJP the number one or number two party. They're either playing second fiddle or they're inconsequential. Second fiddle in Maharashtra, many other states are inconsequential as parties. And which means that the parties that do matter there are local parties, regional, and therefore local in their outlook. Largely, largely. Not that regional parties are bad, but a, a system which actually does not reward a political party with some 10-15% vote, but spread over across the whole country or the state, that system is extremely vicious in its consequences. And uh, the second consequence of this um, uh, current system of elections is precisely what we discussed earlier. The Manmohan Singhs are not electable. It's not an accident that Dr. Manmohan Singh could not get elected from India's most uh, literate city. And so this reinforces the wrong type of people. Exactly. But what about the argument that PR, if it were to be brought into India, would entrench caste, regional and language divisions? That presupposes that right now caste is not entrenched in our uh, society. The reality is that caste is one of the key determinants of our politics. But the difference is... So you're saying things can't get worse on that front? No, things will actually be better. Because the difference is right now, the caste which have dominance locally, local concentrations, they are the ones that are benefiting. Whereas the groups that are spread across the country or the state, they are the ones which are losing out. Therefore, it's a very skewed system which is perpetuating the feudal oligarchy. This would change the balance. This would change the balance. Beyond all of this is the problem of the sort of people who enter politics. Again, your writings are very clear on this subject. You say very few with intellect, integrity, commitment to public service and passion for improvement could enter the political arena and survive. How do we change that? I think a political system change is required. First of all, I believe a switch to proportional representation combined with some kind of a direct election at the state and local levels to the head of the government will make a significant difference because then you don't require too much of a party support for the direct election. You don't require much of money. The power. list system would help good people get in. They, they would get in. 
The second is empowering local governments. That again. Welcome back to People Who Matter. My guest is a man who's campaigning to make Indian democracy clean, Jay Prakash Narayan. Dr. Narayan, let's talk about yourself. You were born in a village in Andhra Pradesh in 1956. What sort of family do you come from? I might say lower middle class, middle class family. My father was employed in the railways, but in another state, Maharashtra. So I grew up with my old aunt, a childhood widow. So a home where there is not much of a problem in terms of basics, the food, etc., and clothing. Uh, but there was no private toilet at home. There was um, no electricity. So no, the typical village in this country. I You've known village. hardship as a child. Uh, I didn't know it was hardship at the time. <laughs> Uh, so, but I can understand, I can relate to the way the people feel and uh, they, they go through the agony and also the, the, the glory of being together in a community and respecting each other and the ugliness of the caste system. You also recognize the importance of human bonds? I do. I think I'm a villager at heart. Wherever I am, basically I'm a villager at heart. So. Once upon a time, I gather you were a great admirer of Indira Gandhi. As everyone was during those days of 1970s, early 70s. But you became very disillusioned when you realized that Garibi Hatao was just a political slogan. Yes, by 1973 it was clear that uh, what we dreamed of was not happening. There was a lot of uh, anguish, yes, no question about it. In fact, I gather that the emergency when you were at university was a particularly depressing time. Is it true that for a brief while as a student you actually contemplated suicide? That may be a bit of an exaggeration because, um, yes, I was deeply anguished, an enormous amount of pain. Uh, and I would have gladly died if somebody told me, look, by jumping from your third floor hostel room, uh, something positive would emerge. Uh, in that sense, it was more of a positive feeling rather than uh, a negative depression. One. Yes. Uh, I, I could have given up my life quite happily, but not suicide, no. On the other hand, I gather that in 1974, you came to be deeply impressed by the way the American system had cleansed itself, both of President Nixon and the horrible canker of corruption that he represented. Was it, in fact, the whole impeachment process and the open glare of daylight in which it happened that impressed you? Yes, the 73-74 was a glorious period for democracy in that sense, uh, that the mightiest man in the world politically could be humbled by a Negro janitor who, who stumbled upon these fellows who were burgling the Watergate Hotel. And then it's not so much what the president did, but the fact that he obstructed justice, that that could bring him down and the system could be so unforgiving. Uh, when such a gross constitutional uh, distortion was perpetrated. It was actually quite an amazing thing, considering that in our country, then or now, major, major crimes and misdemeanors and constitutional improprieties, uh, we take them rather slightly. You know, did, did, really did this experience make you realize that accountability is both important, but it's also achievable if there's a will to achieve it? Absolutely. It's an institutional issue. It's not individual. Indians are the same as Americans or Britishers or Germans. It's just that we haven't built institutions. Today, you're a member of the National Advisory Council, an organization that I at least like to talk of as the conscience of the government. But would you ever consider getting into outright politics yourself? I think it's one of the hardest questions in this country for many concerned citizens. In a sane democracy, politics should be the answer to the problems. But our democracy is so perverted that politics that ought to be the answer has become the problem itself. And yet, without political activity in some form, without mobilizing people, without restoring that legitimacy and that nobility to the political process, there's no hope for the country. Therefore, I believe that there are three things we have to do. First is mobilizing the public opinion, making them understand the detail rather than the overall you know, large slogans and grand things about liberty. That's an information campaign. Yes. The second is fight for a change of rules of the game to the extent that's feasible within the system. Yes. The second is fight for a change of rules of the game to the extent that's feasible within the system and some of it is happening, the right to information the system of local courts, improved political funding. You know, some things are happening. That's the sort of work Lok Sattva is doing. Yes. Uh, but the third is, ultimately, we must fight for the change of the rules of the game. If it happens within the system, it's fine uh, by the existing political framework. Otherwise, we must, must mend the political parties, really transform the nature of political parties. Ah, how do you do that? It has to be public pressure. If they don't mend, I suppose, uh, people must uh, fashion also new political forces, but with new political culture. What we need is not merely new players but not merely change of rule, change of players, but the change in the rules of the game. So a new political culture is required. 1970, uh, 70s, the whole struggle was how to find an alternative to Congress party. Whereas today it's not Congress or BJP or TDP or um, uh, RJD or... Uh, how do you BJD. find better politicians? I think they're there. I think people are there. The point is, have we created a systemic incentives to 
make them work. But the problem is the people are undoubtedly there because in a population of a billion it would be hugely depressing to say they're not there. <laughs> but how do you get them to come forward? I mean, if a man like you won't take that plunge, why would others do so? I think in many ways what many of us are doing is politics, except that we have not entered the electoral arena because we find it simply not uh, uh, not easy or not, not possible in the current situation. And also abhorrent. No, it's not abhorrent to me at all. I wouldn't say that. I don't regard politics as a... I so it's not a matter of principle, it's a matter of practicality. It's our own capacity, I would say. It's not so much the principle. Politics is to me a noble endeavor. If it were to become easier, or let me put it differently, if a major party most of whose policies and principles you accept and respect, and I use the word most advisedly, or to say, Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan, join us, we need you. I don't see that uh, chance at all um, of their asking or uh, looks at the moment or me personally joining. Because they're too scared that you represent so radical a change it would undermine them. And even if they for some reason wanted it, the political culture they represent is not really the right one. So India requires new political culture. If the parties transform themselves, I think the best in the country must get into them. But if that doesn't happen, then I think the best must look for new political culture rather than merely join but the But we could be waiting in that case for a long, long time. I don't believe so. I'm a great optimist. I believe that things are changing already and there is a desperate urge across the country. It's just that we have to summon the will and the courage to put these pieces together. And you say you're an optimist. Can this happen in your lifetime and mine? I'm talking in the next five, ten years. As soon as that? As soon as that. You're sure country? you're not hoping for a miracle? No. The country is ready in a fundamental sense. In, in every party, in every household, in every state, in every village, a million conversations are taking place about this. Only thing is the praxis of the call that's now, right now happening. The issue is how do you put it together in a coherent way and I think... That's Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Millions of people listening to you will say, I hope he's right. And then the same millions will say, I have a horrible feeling he's just being an optimist. How do you assure them that this is actually grounded in some real belief that it will happen. What are the things that are required for people really to assert? One is ignorance. We think we are very smart, but actually in India, most of our knowledge is irrelevant. We know about Dingbatu's capital or the currency of Peru or the president of some country. We don't really understand the things that matter to us. How do you enroll yourself as a voter? How do you actually see the electoral process going? And what are the outcomes, etc.? We have to have informed public. Is uh, that discourse. information happening? Uh, I think increasingly, but not sufficiently. And when it happens, you think it will lead to this change of culture? I have no doubt about it. And that in turn will lead to better people coming into politics? Absolutely. But it will all happen in five short years? Five to ten years, not necessarily because of uh, your effort and my effort, Karan, but because status quo is no longer sustainable. It is that compulsion that will drive India towards change. You know, when big change happens... So there's a compulsion under the ground that's just pushing things. Absolutely. What the Germans called a sort of Zietgeist. Absolutely. It's happening despite us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're a man who's taken on incredible challenges. I've mentioned three or four of them. There are a host more that I can't mention. Where do you get the will and the drive? <laughs> I'm an agnostic. I, uh, I don't have any faith in the traditional sense, but I do believe there is a sin. And there are two great sins. Uh, one is unfulfilled potential. The second is avoidable suffering. These two are in abundance in this country and they make me angry. They make me angry, partly because they're immoral, they make me deeply concerned because they're so wholly unnecessary. We can do a lot more. But that anger also is your driving force. Certainly. But I learned to channelize that constructively and creatively. I don't normally show my angry face. Well, in which case, let me end this interview by saying, long may you stay angry. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Narayan, a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much.